it's not, I'm not texting. I'm just kind of thumbing through questions and thinking of stuff. So don't be like, what's this asshole doing? (laughs) You know, texting. Hey everyone, if you weren't paying attention on Twitter or Facebook, we did our six-month Patreon giveaway. We gave away a four-year Willet Family Estate single barrel bourbon, ice molds, bourbon samples, and more. Thank you to everyone that has made this podcast so successful. We can't thank you enough. We keep hearing more stories of people saying that they're evangelizing our podcast to their friends and family that are getting into bourbon. You know, you guys keep spreading the bourbon gospel, and we're going to keep bringing you new shows. Uh, first bit of news, one of our listeners has one of the very rare Buffalo Trace OFCs available. This is the first release comprised of only 200 bottles, 100 bottles from the year 1980, 50 bottles from 1982, and 50 bottles from 1983. This is the only bottle that's going to ever be available, and it's only to nonprofit organizations as a means for fundraising. You might have read about this on Whiskey Wash or other news sites, but this bottle is going towards the Hopestone Cancer Support Center in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. This bottle will be auctioned off on December 11th, and you do not have to be present to win, but if you want to, you can submit your bid by calling Hopestone at 918-766-4673. Thanks again for everybody that's been a part of this, and always remember to support the show on Patreon. That's patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, slash bourbon pursuit. back with another episode of the Bird Pursuit Podcast. Uh, Ryan here today. Uh, Kenny could not make it. He actually had a real job, real work event, which is rare. Uh, normally he's out hunting bourbon and doing stuff, so he actually had to work today. But uh, really excited about today's show. It's post-election day. Uh, just made myself a bourbon to, uh, you know, no matter who your candidate was, I think it's a time to celebrate it's that over. it's over. Right. Gosh, Nothing it's, else. Yeah. Because it, it's just the, the bickering back and forth. I think we all just need a drink to chill out and move forward. But anyways, I'm really excited for our guest today. It's uh, Jim Kokoris. Okay. Yes, it's very good. Jim Kokoris. Okay, great. And he is the author of a book called The Big Man of Jim Beam, Book or No, and the Number One Bourbon in the World, and also Beam Straight Up, The Bold Story of the First Family of Bourbon. Uh, so, Jim, welcome to the show. Glad to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here and talk a little bit about my old friend, Booker No. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to hear about it, too. Um, so, before you kind of got started with the Bean family and before we get into the book and everything, so give us your background a little bit. How how did you become into writing? How did you kind of get involved with it? What was your kind of experience with bourbon at first? Well, it's uh, interesting. I have kind of, It's kind of a two-tiered Story, I guess. On one, one level, I'm a, in a public relations firm, uh, JSHA. It's a small boutique PR firm in Chicago that has worked for the Jim Beam Company for a number of years. So in, in that capacity, I worked for Jim Beam uh, doing writing, speech writing, script writing, and general public relations work for Booker Now uh, when we used to travel around the country, uh, when we used to host bourbon tastings. Uh, on another level, I'm also a writer. Um, I've published four different novels. i um, a fiction writer. Um, my last one was called It's Nice Outside. came out a few months ago at St. Martin's Press. So um, I had this public relations bourbon experience and then this, this writing background. So when the Jim Beam Company or Beam Centauri uh, wanted to write Booker Knows biography of the legendary distiller, Jimmy's grandson, uh, I was probably a logical choice since I've had the experience uh, to write and I've also knew uh, Booker through the PR effort. So it all kind of merged together. So did you, did you uh, kind of stumble upon meeting the, the Beam family or did you all kind of seek each other out or how did that well, work exactly? Well, we just won the business and the gotcha. agency and um, for years we just handled the regional things that a public relations marketing firm would do for, uh, do for Jim Beam. Then um, fate intervened and uh, the person who used to travel with Booker, this was in the early 90s, uh, when they were introducing the small batch bourbon collection, which included Booker's, the famous uncut, unfiltered bourbon at the time, um, it's for a super premium bourbon. So we travel around the country. This uh, this woman um, um, got pregnant. Um, she was married and started a family. So they turned to me because I was a speechwriter and, and did public relations. So hey, could you fill in for her and be uh, you know Booker's introduce Booker at these bourbon tastings? We did you know quite a few of these a month around the country. Um, be his straight man, talk about bourbon history, and deal with the press afterwards. So I jumped at that chance, thinking it was just going to be temporary. 
Um, but that, you know, six week, eight week assignment turned into over 10 years of me traveling around the country. So I got to know him and I got to know the bourbon industry and the company very well. So I merged somewhat as the company and family historian and, and you know, a heritage person as well through my work, uh, through, the, through my many years. So what kind of person was Bart Booker? Like, how was he to hang around? Because everybody knows he is a legend, you know, he's one of the famous icons in the industry, but like, what kind of man was he? He was, um, for people who do know him, uh, he lived up to his reputation. He was literally and figuratively larger than life. Big guy, yeah. six foot three, I don't know if you'd met him. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you knew him from Bardstown. Um, I'm going to guess 350, 400 pounds, frequently wore a cowboy hat or a vest and uh, or for more formal affairs, a big bright red sports coat. Had a great voice, talk <laughs> like this. I mean, it was a voice right out of uh, central casting. Um, funny, opinionated, could be temperamental, um, and, and, uh, and but very curious too. Very curious on um, how things are made, how uh, how to improve processes, and particularly in the making of bourbon. How to improve recipes, and particularly in the making of bourbon. Though he, he fancied himself quite a chef to varying degrees of success there. <laughs> um, a sportsman, a hunterman, a hunter, a fisherman. Um, uh, you know, kind of a raconteur. I mean, just, you know, a, a, an American original is the best way to say it. Um, could say stuff that might get him in trouble, but people would give him a pass because he was Booker. <laughs> he just he had no uh, real filter. He did what he wanted to do, said what he wanted to do, and people loved him for it. So, you know, master distillers today are kind of like celebrities and rock right. stars. And uh, so kind of talk about like Booker's real life like i mean before the bourbon boom you know master stillers back in the day were actually in the factory you know right. they're getting their hands dirty doing it so kind of talk about some of the his daily you know processes and making the whiskey well he started out uh the jim beam's flagship plant is in claremont um kentucky um that's where the tourists would go and that's where people want to go visit a distillery they're going to go there but booker spent very little of his long career there he actually spent it in a more remote outpost in boston kentucky which is uh, a few miles down the road uh, not really open to the public. Um, so that was there, uh, a smaller distillery in size, but not necessarily in, in, in production. It was there that um, and he, he, law, he learned the craft. And, and there were times, and he, he was the first to tell me sometimes, it could be monotonous. I mean, he, well, he worked his way up. It wasn't like he was immediately became a master distiller. Now, who distiller. taught him? What do you know? His, his cousin, Carl Beam. Okay. Um, Carl Beam was the master distiller of both distilleries, the Claremont plant and the Boston plant. Um, Booker was uh, hired kind of reluctantly by his cousin Carl. Because Booker was kind of a hellraiser, and uh, he had a brief college career at University of Alabama, he had, uh, University of Kentucky, where he briefly worked uh, play football for Bear Bryant. Uh, he didn't didn't work out too well. Um, so, and he went to work for a lumberyard. And Carl, his cousin. Um, uh, was kind of encouraged to take Booker on. So they put him over in the remote outpost at the time, Boston Plant, um, which Beam had recently purchased. It used to have been an old, uh, another old distillery. I think it was a Churchill Downs distillery. And it was kind of dilapidated, kind of falling apart. And Booker just was kind of in charge of resurrecting this thing. Um, do the hire. He was everything. He was the human resource director, the procurement manager. Uh, he, he became the distiller um, at, a, at a young age. I hired a lot of his old buddies, so it was really quite a, I always said it was kind of a combination of like uh, Animal House and, and Stripes over there. It was just a bunch of guys doing kind of whatever they wanted to do, but yeah. the, the, the folks up in Chicago who owned the company seldom if ever went down to the Boston plant too. Uh, so he learned the ropes there, and because he, he didn't, he was kind of a, a, out of the eye of the corporation in the um, eye of the public, he could, could do some experimentation, try different things. Um, um, you know, move thing, try different processes in particular. He's always trying to do make bourbon uh, and more efficiently. Always trying to increase the yield and the capacity. Uh, every day was a big thing. Uh, ultimately, he and his cousin Carl became kind of a bit of a competitors on that. Who made the best whiskey? Who made the <laughs> most whiskey? So, um, but his days were long. It would start, you know, early in the morning. Um, he'd bring his what he called his meat sandwich, which he'd put on the <laughs> come in the morning, um, leave his meat sandwich on the back of a radiator or a steam pipe where it would stay warm. He'd make the rounds. He checked the corn, bite into it to see if it was a certain flavor, a certain uh, moisture. 
Uh, he talked about what they called back then the government man. Because <laughs> back then they'd have, you know, government men who would have to literally unlock the keys to the distillery and, 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 and some of the other facilities too before you could start to work. So he would shoot the breeze with the government man. He always got along with them. You weren't, they, the friendship was not necessarily encouraged between those the government men and distillers, but, you know, impossible not to like Booker. Yeah. Um, uh, he'd check out the warehouses. Uh, then he'd go to his little cinder block office and... Um, do his reluctantly do some paperwork maybe his cousin Carl would give him a call and then um, at the end of the day this was kind of fun or unique that I learned as part of the book was um, he'd gather four or five of those distillery working buddies and they sit around a table in the office and they would sample various bourbons and some of it had been aged for a while some of it had been redlined, as they call it. In other words, bourbon that uh, was kind of off a few years ago. So they kind of had a, kept an eye on it, and, and they wanted to see if it had gotten better. Um, and a lot of it was just the, uh, the whiskey that was real fresh and new green whiskey, or otherwise called as White Tog. And they'd all pass it around, and Booker would give the thumbs up or thumbs down. Other guys around the table would weigh in, but at the end of the day, really there was only one vote that counted. It was Booker's, who had a legendary... And I saw this in action. Uh, this is not just myth. And there are some myths surrounding Booker, but this is not one of them. He could tell... <laughs> myths a, in barber industry. Yeah, right, right, right. The whole industry seems to be based on myth. But yeah. this one I saw, I mean, he could just take a sip, you know, chew it around in his mouth a little bit, as he called it, and he could tell the, you know, the, the, you know, the proof and the age with uncanny accuracy. And a lot of those guys down there would bet he couldn't do that. So Booker more than happily took their money because he usually could say that's a you know, four-year-old, that's a five-year-old. Uh, that's a certain proof uh, just from the palate. He had a really a great palate. So um, part artist and part scientist. And um, uh, so that's where, you know, he spent his formative, well, the, the bulk of his career was in the, in the small Boston plant. So, you know, obviously Booker, a lot of his career was in when bourbon wasn't popular. And he went through right. some very hard times. You talk about the tornado inventory loss and so forth. But kind of... I guess you kind of briefly touched on it, but how did he have the foresight to see that premium bourbon, you know, single barrels, small batches? Because back then, you know, four to six year, eight years, kind of like that's the real steel stuff and the age stuff was kind of like crap. We're not going to, you know, do True. much of that. But how, talk about that. How do you have the foresight? Well, um, he liked to experiment, liked to innovate. So he was always making stuff. Um, God knows what else he made that never came to market. Stuff that maybe I don't even know about this. Um, uh, so it was really partly his um, achievement that he came out with Booker's, and partly it was um, the, the corporation, too, when they found out he was making the stuff. But uh, a couple of things that were going on in the 80s at the time. One, another competing distiller, and I forgot the name, and I won't mention it if I did, <laughs> uh, came out with a single barrel uh, uh, bourbon um, that did relatively okay. What, um, and at the same time, during the mid, we're talking early to mid 80s, single malt scotches were starting to make their presence felt. Higher end scotch, people were willing to spend 30, 40, 50, even 60, 70 dollars on a bottle of, of single malt scotch. So the Kentucky distillers were seeing this happening and they were kind of saying, well, why not us? Booker was thinking, well, if they're paying that kind of money for a bottle of that Scottish whiskey, why won't they give, a, give a, maybe, the, maybe the world is now ready for um, an ultra premium bourbon like Booker's. So um, once again, another company had come out with it. Booker kept an eye on that. Um, he started making what ultimately became known as Booker's bourbon in the really early to mid 80s. And uh, he gave it away to friends and family um, as Christmas gifts. And uh, this is not legend. I guess you have not <laughs> to prove this. Uh, but, uh, 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 an executive from the Chicago home office flew down one day and Bean was great at, you know, trying to do other things right now with them. Um, they're, they're thinking about doing the ultra premium bourbons too. So they, he, he said, came to the Boston plant and asked Booker, said, you know, we're thinking, of, what do you have that's special? We want to give it out as gifts to our top retailers and distributors around the holidays. And we don't want to give them the usual flowers and candy or tickets to ball games. <laughs> what do you got? And Booker, yeah, I got this. I got some so, barrel proof whiskey. Yeah, we are. <laughs> Try this on, Mike. So he pulled out this whiskey bottle, which is unmarked. And uh, gave the, the, the man Mike, whose name was uh, Mike Dono, I believe his name was. And the rest, as they can say, is history. The 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 the, C, the the marketing man, sales marketing manager, took a sip, and I was saying, "Tasted the future." And he said, "This stuff's good. How much do you got of it?" <laughs> and Booker didn't have a lot. And um, for just that first year, and I think it was '86. Now um, they just sent a handful of uh, bad, uh, bourbon out to retailers and distributors. Then in 87, they actually shipped it to retailers and distributors for sale. But it was a very uh, small quantity. They didn't have a lot of it. 
and there was no marketing dollars behind it whatsoever. I mean, Booker really had to go looking around for the bottles they ultimately ended up using. He found a lot of old Chablis wine bottles that he could get for free. That the label on, he did it himself with a world famous typo on it. He was nervous when he was doing his kitchen table to <laughs> describe the bourbon. He, he, mis, uh, he forgot to capitalize a, a beginning of a sentence too for some reason and never changed that. It looked pretty primitive, the bottle, but also it was a very authentic and that authenticity I think reflected Booker's own authenticity too. So Booker's got out there couple of years, word of mouth, no advertising, no big, no big bucks behind it. But the bartenders started to fall in love with it. They started pushing it. And by the, you know, by early 1990s, uh, it was already, it was firmly established as, as kind of a, a wild bourbon. What is this? And it was a, you know, higher proof, um, longer aged and higher price too. Um, and then a year or two after that, Booker um, came out with the remaining Three bourbons from the small batch bourbon collection, Knob Creek, Basil Hayden's, and Baker's bourbon. I'll stress that because that was named after his cousin Baker. I mentioned earlier that Carl Bean, this is Baker's a father. Baker is Booker's cousin, I think his third cousin. And he ran the, the Claremont Distillery, uh, while Booker remained at the Boston Distillery, even though Booker was the master distiller for the two plants at this point in his career. Uh, but Baker, uh, th- throughout the 70s and 80s, ran the Claremont plant, too. Baker was very understated, complete opposite personality-wise of, uh, 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 of Booker, too, but they worked very, very well together. And Baker's still very much alive and well. In fact, I'll be seeing him tomorrow. <laughs> He's living, he lives just down the road from the distillery. Uh, so anyway, it came out with the Baker's bourbon, and uh, it was really, that was really the, um, you know, we're talking about the current bourbon, bourbon boom, which shows no signs of slowing. In fact, I read a story yesterday, there some predictions it was going to continue for a decade still. But it could really trace its roots back to the 90s. Um, um, it was when Small Badge came out. It was Booker who then, his, his products in his his uh, skill in making bourbon is coupled with his larger-than-life personality, um, really propelled uh, those bourbons forward and put bourbon on the map. Also um, led to the rise of what we now call the celebrity master distiller. Mm-hmm. Right. So Booker uh, retired from day-to-day operations, became distiller emeritus, and really hit the road promoting the bourbons around the world and entered uh, young Jim Kikoris. Um And that's when I was assigned to him, right when the bourbons were taking off. And we traveled around the country and at first our um, conducting these small batch bourbons at beginning of small crowds, 20, 30 people at various restaurants or hotels or even retail chains or bars. But by the end of our uh, experience with three, four hundred people would come and wait for a half hour, 45 minutes for Booker's autograph. <laughs> Never mind. Never my autograph, but always Booker's autograph. Um, and <laughs> like, who's that guy? What's that? They were looking at you like, who's that yeah, guy? Who's that guy? You're <laughs> out of the way. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is, you know, obviously, no one wanted, there's no reason to get my autograph. So, um, but we spent those 10 years on the road. I'm saying, the, I would say three or four nights a month uh, traveling to various cities. And um, we would conduct these tastings. Then, you know, we'd the, be the big dinner at the key account where more tastings would take place. And everyone wanted a, a minute of Booker's time. What was that like? Did he embrace, you know, the fame or did he kind of, you know, or is he just doing it for business strictly or did he enjoy, you know, kind of the crowds? Uh, I would definitely say he enjoyed people. <laughs> yeah. He, he was definitely a people person. He always had a huge, uh, I used to call it the Kentucky Mafia, an uh, entourage with him. He just grew up with, you know, with a bunch of guy friends in grammar school and, and military school and then later on in, in high school and college. Uh, so he always had an entourage with him. Uh, so he, was, he just liked being the center of attention. He was very comfortable being the center of attention. Partly it's because of his personality. Partly it was just because he's told me once was his size. People just, <laughs> yeah. just stood out. Yeah, I mean, obviously he got a little smaller as he got older. But in his prime, he was just a big guy with this great voice. So people just kind of gravitated towards him. And he was, um, as I mentioned, kind of the center of attention to very, very at ease with people. Very at ease of uh, public speaking. Very at ease with the media. Never, never, ever regarded himself as anything special. I mean, he was, you know, down-to-earth, humble guy. Never, ever developed any kind of um, ego to speak of, too. And he was, you know, in his own way, a, a big-time celebrity within his industry. And he got a fair amount of media attention, too. He was on numerous television shows. Um, um, he was in a very famous country music video uh, with Hank Williams Jr. Oh, yeah. Called, yeah, called Young Country. And Hank was a big bourbon and beam fan. Fred kind of made those uh, introductions as song. I've heard there's been store, you know, in Bardstown that uh, Hank and like Kid Rock would come and play on their, oh, you yeah. know, on their back porch or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
But Hank was kind of tight with the Beam family for a while. And um, so he was in that video. And then you, uh, Esquire magazine, which was a very, very popular magazine back in the 80s, had a huge profile on him, too. He was on numerous uh, local and I think a few national TV shows as well. So he had a following. But just, you know, if it had gone away tomorrow, we'd have been fine with it. <laughs> Yeah, is there any, you know, memorable, I guess, you know, traveling around with him, any memorable stories that stick out? Well, I, I've told the story before, um, and I'll tell it again. Um, once again, a lot of myth and legend surrounding Booker, this one's true, um, 100% because I was there. Um, I'm not sure the exact year, probably the early 90s. Booker was down here in Kentucky, and he was heading up to Alaska to go fishing with his buddies. But he was going to drive, and which is uh, God knows how long would drive is. That's what Booker preferred to do. So he had his pickup, and I got wind of it, <clears throat> or I knew it about his travel plans. And I said, hey, Booker, on the way, could you stop in Chicago? I'm going to um, arrange a lunch with you and some reporters at a nice restaurant. They want to talk to you about your bourbons, Booker bourbon. Um, fine, 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 fine. <laughs> so it was a, it was a, it was lunch. I, I may have said dinner in the book, but it was definitely lunch, and. Um, he made the mistake, a mistake for the restaurant, in ordering the country ham at the Chicago restaurant. Well, you know, this ham was not up to Booker's standards. Booker, next to bourbon, loved ham. He smoked his own hams. He had a brick smokehouse in his backyard on North 3rd Street in, in Bardstown um, that Jim Green uh, had built. So he knew how to smoke ham, salt it. He made unbelievable ham, which I, I had the fortune to eat many times. But this, this, this ham up in Chicago was not up to snuff. So he threw this fork and knife down on the table in, in disgust. Then also threw me the keys to his truck. And he said, you know, in that great gravelly voice of his, Oh, Jim, go in my truck. <laughs> and and I, I got a ham in my <laughs> trunk. And bring it in here. I want to eat it. And I was, you know, I'd been booker for many years at that point. But I was. this was a first, bringing food into a restaurant, a nice restaurant. And this is a big ham. Um, so I did it. I knew I, uh, one reason why I lasted so long with Booker was that I just did pretty much anything Booker wanted me to do. So um, I went out to the truck, brought this I don't know, six, seven, eight pound ham. I it was huge. It was actually literally heavy to carry. And I came into the restaurant and the major street stopped me and said, sir, you can't bring food in here. I said, you tell it to that guy the cowboy had over there. The, uh, the waiter or the major d took Booker in one glance and you realize he was no match for Booker. Waves me over with this huge ham. I brought this ham down on the kitchen, on the restaurant table, much of the shock and surprise and confusion of uh, the reporters I was with, as well as the rest of the restaurant. This was a ham that stood out. Booker then takes out kind of a fishing knife that he had in his pocket, which apparently he always carried with him too. And so I was hacking off hunks of the <laughs> ham and started passing around to the reporters, eating some himself, passing off some to me, makes the waiter have some, makes the waiter get the chef, makes the chef come out and eat the ham. The Booker sits him down. <laughs> he's ready to show it off. <laughs> yeah, and he's always giving him a tutorial on how yeah. to make Kentucky. And by the end of the meal, he was passing out to other customers who were lining up for his autograph and as well as for Booker's homemade ham, Suzo. That was just a, kind of like just another day in Booker's that's, life. That's hilarious. That's that's funny. Uh, so, you know, Booker passed away, I guess, was it 2004? And mm -hmm. so, you know, bourbon obviously had, you know, it was booming then, but now it's even crazier. And uh, so do you think, you know, with the way the bourbon industry now is, like with really expensive special releases, age statements going away, and just people camping out for, you know, for bottles, do you think, do you think, what do you think he would think of it? Do you think he'd be proud of it or kind of be like, what's going on? Or? I, I think he'd be proud of it. I do. He, he really liked trying new things. He was very, very excited and proud of the small batch bourbons. Um, he liked us talking about various bur bur bourbons. Um, there were a handful of uh, crap uh, bourbons coming out even back in his time, too. Um, you know, young distillers would come and ask him for advice. He was very happy to give it to them. Um, I think he'd be very proud and excited to see what was going on right now. Yeah, for sure. And you also did another book about Fred, um, Beam Straight Up, the bold story of the family of bourbon, the first family of bourbon. So kind of talk about Fred and how he's like Booker, but different from Booker. Well, I do want to clarify that um, I did not write that book. Oh, okay. I, gotcha. I edited it. I edited it. Gotcha. It gotcha. was Fred's book. I was, you know, Fred No with Jim Kikoris. That's Fred's words, and I helped put it together. Gotcha. Um but there, well, we're from Barstow. Our grammar's terrible, sure, so sure, we sure. need some help. <laughs> right, right, right. So that that came out a few years ago. Um, and I'm, I'm close friends with Fred, and um, he and I shared a lot of Booker stories together. 
both some fun, not so fun. <laughs> some <laughs> we, would incur, right. we would both incur the wrath of Booker. <laughs> um, but uh, alike in certain ways, but Fred is more affable and more easygoing and more flexible. Um, and um, in, in many ways, from a PR person's perspective, a better spokesman, um, just quicker on his feet, can deliver uh, the right messages to the at the right time. Booker was just, you know, he, he could be a PR man's nightmare at times, too. <laughs> right. Uh, but Catch him on the wrong day. Absolutely. Or, the wrong day. or yeah. Or, and, but Fred is, uh, is he, 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 you know, he started his career in the night bottling line as a supervisor. So nothing was given to him. He logged in 20 long years uh, before he ended up evolving into this bourbon ambassador, then, then became the master distiller, too. So he knows his stuff. Um, and also, I think there's a certain um, respect and appreciation he has for the position he holds um, as well. And, and you can tell that he just relishes his job. Um, he, in, in many ways, he can connect with crowds even in a more effective way than Booker could, because he can relate to him more, I think. And maybe it's an age thing, too. Is when Booker, I mean, Fred's been doing it for, I don't know how many years now, but, you know, Booker was always considerably older than the audience he was speaking to. In, in many cases, Fred was the same age as the audience, too. So there's a certain relatability thing there, too. Booker was really, uh, you know, uh, Fred was a little bit more on the younger side to be a master distiller, too. So um, in terms of... Um, uh, similarities, great personalities, um, um, same kind of voice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> great appreciation for uh, fine foods. And um, uh, Booker, uh, I think, liked uh, bourbon a little bit more for, to, you know, consu- on the consumption, consumption side. Yeah. Well, Fred is uh, uh, not that Booker was a heavy drinker, but Booker was also a much larger person, so he had a bigger <laughs> capacity. To right. Drink. Fred is, he's certainly not a teetotaler, but um, he, he really truly does drink in moderation and, uh, and respects whiskey in, in that sense, too. So not, a, 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 not the Hellraiser, I think, that Booker was. Um, I think Fred had his Hellraising phase in high school <laughs> and college. Well, the, the seven I think we all do, you know. Yeah, the seven <laughs> colleges Fred went to, but, um, but he, he matured. Um, in a lot of ways, maybe matured quicker than Booker did. Yeah. So you know, if you want to listen more about Fred, we interviewed him earlier uh, in an earlier episode. We went down to the distillery and interviewed Fred. It's a great episode. He's very laid back. I mean, tells it how it is. He does, he's like, yeah, said, he's like, he's like, I hate bullshit. You know, he's a, he's a ba- he, they're both straight. Shoot- we're straight shooters. Yeah. And, and I can appreciate that. And both um, very, very humble. Y'all, absolutely, absolutely. But Freddie, I guess, is next in line. So, what do you? How do you think the future is going to be for for him? I think that I think it's uh, very secure. Freddie has been um, Booker used to call him Little Book, Little as a Little Booker. Um, he you reminds me a little bit more of his grandfather in terms of um, some opinions and um, his, his personality. But he incredible students of industry. You know, someone who just really can't learn enough and can't learn fast enough and. I think is eager to continue in the family tradition. I think he's about 20 or 29 years old. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great spot to be in. I, yeah. He's, yeah. He's, he's earning his stripes, though. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Just nothing, like Fred nothing, said, yeah. he started at the beginning. Nothing I think, given to him either. On the podcast, he was talking about his worst job was cleaning out the tomato mix for Bloody Mary's, oh, when okay. he, you know, back in the day. So that was pretty funny to see, you know, him getting his hands dirty, too. So, um, so talk about, you know, kind of. You spent so much time with, I think, 10 years with Booker. How do you condense that down into a book? Well, I was, uh, I was given a certain deadline, unfortunately, <laughs> right. because I would have loved to spend even more time. Um, so I just, I knew enough of his, his life to know the, the story arc. I, I knew I was just going to basically start at the beginning. And as a fiction writer, it was a bit of a challenge for me because I, I had to write, you know, couldn't, couldn't make stuff up this time. <laughs> right. So it, I had to put on a kind of... Well, no, it is the bourbon industry. Yeah, but. you're right. But this time I could have people call me on it. Yeah, exactly. So there's a lot of stuff, you know, going back 200 years ago, no one can check anything. Right. Because there's no records and, you know... The there's bur- no Twitter and... Bourbon yeah, historians and I have a field day because of that freedom, I think, and I'm one of them. But, um, but you know, the people could double check me here. So I, and I had family members looking over my shoulder and I had older, you know, former and current employees from the company looking over my shoulder. So I had to make sure everything was as accurate as I could and that I would take no liberties. But I also really wanted to respect his life. I, and I knew that what I was putting in this book would be because Booker being who he is would be this book would serve as a reference for him and the company for years to come. So and once I put it in this writing, this it was just going to be there forever uh, and it would be used as a resource. I wanted to make sure it was accurate as possible. 
Um, so I, I started at the beginning. I went out to Springfield, Kentucky, and interviewed family members out there, and then just moved on from there. Um, you know, it's not easy to condense a, a 74-year-old man's life into, <laughs> one year, 250 pages, too. So I, I just focused on the highlights. And there were, t- if it had more time, it certainly would have been longer. Um, but I just it was, you know, the publisher was really wanted to get this out. So, um, uh, and I, I'm, I'm very happy with it. I think it's, I've been told it's a very entertaining, informative read, too. So, um, so it was more of um, trying to decide what, what, to what I what made sense to put in and what I would maybe you know put in down the road in a sequel or something like that <laughs> too. So absolutely. Well, so I really appreciate you, Jim taking time to, oh, sure. to come on the show and talk about Booker and Fred. They're definitely icons of the industry, and you know definitely people should get the book. So tell them where it's they the can get the book. The holidays are That's coming right. up, so it's a great purchase. That and a bottle of Booker is what? Wow, what a stocking stuffer! Absolutely, for every bourbon lover's dream, you there know, you get go. that in your stocking. So tell them, tell everyone where they can get the book. I think it. Um, I, I imagine most bookstores if they don't have a copy of it, um, they can order it for you. It's from Wiley. It's a you know legitimate publisher. <laughs> And Wiley out of New York, uh, and uh, Amazon may be the quickest way to get it to, uh, and maybe the most economical to. We'll ship it right to your door. Uh, and I know we got we've got uh, more than enough copies for the holidays. I guess it's selling fairly well, and, it, and we're we're impressed with the kind of the publicity that it has been getting. And it's going to fly off the shelf because you're on the Burn Pursuit podcast. There you go. So, you know, Man, I wouldn't miss it. <laughs> Absolutely. So, what if people want to learn more about you? Where can they find more about you and your other novels? Oh. Uh, well, uh, www.jimkakoris.net. Um, it's um, where you'll see my four other four fiction books, um, uh, and uh, as well as more information about uh, some of my other writings that I've done. Um, I used to write for the Chicago Tribune Sunday Magazine for years, and as well, I wrote um, I was an entertainment critic for the Tribune a hundred years ago too. <laughs> so I got some of those uh, some of those ancient pieces still on my website too and starting to think of writing my uh, my next novel and haven't quite gotten around to writing it yet though i'm still waiting to start mine as well oh, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> well i really appreciate you taking the time again have oh, fun thanks. tonight at yeah, the, the event and um once again you can find his book uh on amazon and uh perfect holiday stuffer oh, well go ahead and if you're down here in kentucky both the jim beam uh, american still house out in claremont and here right in downtown louisville the jim beam Urban Still House, uh, just down the street here on uh, 4th Street, should have copies as well. Awesome, awesome. Well, thanks again. And uh, if you guys have any show suggestions, uh, feedback, comments, we'd love to hear from you. Um, Kenny, hopefully I didn't screw this up too much without you being he here. He did a good job. Yeah, yeah. we fumbled good through job. it. So, uh, I had to cut him off though, after fourth drink. <laughs> yeah, a lot, of, a lot of booze to get me through this. But anyways, I appreciate you guys listening, and uh, we'll see you next time. This podcast of Bourbon Pursuit is in partnership with thewhiskeywash.com, a lifestyle website for news and reviews for people who like whiskey, and for those who think a life without whiskey has no style, thewhiskeywash.com. Mm-hmm.